this weather is too cold. Ugh, this weather is too hot. Ah, the perfect weather. Welcome to What Is It About the Weather, a podcast where we explore the many ways that weather intertwines itself into our lives. I'm your host, Mark Zelanik. This week, well, we're going to talk a little Goldilocks weather, I guess, if you will, but really kind of hit on little things that get us to perfection. In any case, hope your weather is going well, whether it's your weather week, weather month, weather day, weather hour. Since you last listened, things could happen. A lot of change could happen in a very short period of time. And sometimes you can go months without seemingly having much of a change at all. So in any case, I hope you're having perfect weather for you. Mine? Well, okay, so... What is my perfect weather? You guys have heard me talk enough that you probably have a sense of that now. But if I were going to describe it, it would be something along the lines of snow. But it doesn't have to be actively snowing. A, a snowstorm with actually probably even some clearing, maybe where you can see a little bit of blue. I don't mind there still being some snow around. But that contrast in the sky, I really do enjoy. Not too windy. Little wind's fine, just so you feel it. And not too cold. I, you know, I don't want to go out there and just be frozen to death. If you're going to get snow, you want to be able to enjoy it. But it is that time pretty much around the fresh snow, not once it's melted and frozen again and that kind of stuff. That, that's, I guess, if I were going to describe my perfect weather, that would be it. And we'll talk about my perfect weather within the episode because I was hoping, you know, that I was going to have one this weekend where I was going to get that. But Instead, it looks like I'm going to get more of a rain in vet. The storm track is I've been watching. You, you ever had that, right? You're watching a forecast and you really, you're doing that wish casting thing, right? Whether it's for more sun or, or you need some rain and it just kind of keeps skirting by you. Well, this one, you know, we get these storms quite often in the winter up in the northeast. And there's always this fine line. And it's not much different than, than storms I grew up with where there's a fine line between rain and snow. The difference is I usually get more opportunities here to wait and watch and this is definitely a case where it, the track has kind of continued to be more inland so I'm going to be on the rain side it looks like I might get a few few flakes before it comes through but for the most part it's going to be sort of a rain event for me eh whatever some people are get some snow probably some people that would just as soon trade you know positions with me but that's been my weather or what I've been watching of weather It's actually we had probably the coldest weather in the area this week and we're going to have some this upcoming weekend for a winter that hasn't been much of a winter we'll, we'll see where that goes but I think the bigger news probably this week has not necessarily been a specific weather event it was this volcano that's erupted in the Pacific Ocean that's underwater now it's a bit interesting when you look at the dynamics of this volcano right because you, you're kind of wondering, okay, is it above ground? Is it, you because you, you see these? It, it's been amazing satellite images, right? So I, I don't know. It, it would. I've had access to some of that stuff for a while, but I think it's always kind of neat. But long and short of it, island chain Tonga in in the Pacific, seemingly you know like many places in these kind of the Ring of Fire in the Pacific, you don't really know much about it until something like this happens, but. The volcano core itself is still underwater, although there's some islands on the edge that make up kind of the outside of the caldera or, you know, that rim of, of the volcano, if you will. So I wouldn't call it, this not deep underwater, but it's also not something you see. And it's not the first time this volcano has erupted. My speculation is at some point it's going to grow to where even its center core is probably going to be above water level. I just don't know how many years that's going to take or, or what's going to play out that way. But all this imagery, but all the stories that have gone with it, right? You, you get the amazing satellite imagery, as I was just referencing. And I've had people reach out to me, including my friend Craig, who you know was like, this stuff interests me, and I'm watching it with such fascination, partly because of your podcast, and that was nice of him to say. But I, I also think it's partly because people have access to things that maybe they didn't have access to before, whether it's, you know, through their news media or just following it on Twitter, or whatever it is. I'll put a couple of links in the show notes. So if you didn't get a chance to see it, you can do that. It, it is still kind of cool to watch this stuff unfold. Now, not cool for the people that are there. And there was a tsunami associated with it. Doesn't sound like it was a horrible one, thankfully. But 
volcanoes in general have this interesting impact on weather that I don't think people think a lot about. And I thought I would bring that into the mix with kind of the perfect weather. So we'll come back to that. But again, Craig, thanks for reaching out and for your kind words about the podcast. It was It's always nice to hear. As always, people, whether you want to talk just weather, if you find an interesting story, whatever it is, what is it about the weather on gmail.com? You're always welcome to reach me. Of course, you can hit me up on Twitter. I get some people that hit me up there. They tend to be more people that I engage with in a professional environment as well. But I have a, a few folks that just are, you know, kind of weather interested folks that, that connect with me on there. Whatever's easiest. Always love to hear from you. Always interested in knowing what's interesting to you because that is going to be different for sometimes what you see versus what I see or what you find fascinating. Any case, love to hear from you. Never feel shy. No stupid questions. You, you know the rules, but it's always fun to engage with you guys. But let's talk about perfect weather. And like I said, I'm going to bring this whole volcano story into the mix. Seemed like a good time. I've been, this is an episode that's kind of been out there for a while because I really didn't know how I wanted to get into perfect weather. Because I think, like I said, all of us probably have something that we would use to describe perfect weather. I gave you my example, right, before we got into the main topic. But for each of us, it's probably a little different, right? Some people might like snow like me. Some people may never want to see snow. Some people may just think temperature in the, you know, I don't know, right around 25C or, or, you know, in the mid-70s is perfect. And blue skies, they don't want to see a cloud. Whatever it might be, we, we all have these different little things. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how on some ways everybody's weather you, you think okay the no rain no no clouds or I don't care sort of thing or you know whatever defines your perfect thing is I get it all the time where I live and you may think therefore it's a simple thing or you know you maybe you take it for granted is I guess what I'm getting at in that regard whereas my weather that's perfect I kind of have to seek it out I got to either live in the right places or travel to the right places or accept the fact that I don't need perfect weather all the time that, that may be close enough every so often is good enough for me, or maybe not having perfect weather all the time is an example for me of making it that much more important. You know, that, that as you've heard me say, I, I just like weather. So, you know, I guess I could argue that perfect weather is just weather. But I wanted to talk about how it's little things, whether you see them or not, that can make the difference in what creates your perfect weather. And I'm just going to give you a few examples, a few things to think about, because sometimes I like to do with these episodes is leave you with an examination opportunity for yourself, because maybe you've never thought about it that way. And if you, again, if you get stuck or want some inputs on it, feel free to reach out. If not, that's fine too. But in life, there are lots of moments that we see what we kind of think of as perfect. And I'll give you an example that's not weather because I always, you know, like to bring inner, you know, twining elements into this. But it's something else that I'm kind of passionate about, which is photography. And I, and I know there are very few pictures I've ever taken that I consider even close to what I would call kind of a perfect photo. This, the right place, the, you know, set up, it, everything just worked out, whatever it is. But I had a friend this week in just kind of a group chat scenario sent a picture of their dog, right? And it wasn't of the dog themselves. It was a picture looking up their stairs where they happened to have a little alcove with this, this pretty blue glass vase. And the sun was shining in just on the porch of the wall below that. And the dog's head was turned just a certain way. And it was in the sun. And it was just a moment, right? It was just a perfect moment. Is everything about the picture perfect? No, it was done on a you know, with a phone in a moment. And so some of the coloring around the edges isn't great, but what it captured in that moment, you can't get most of the time because the, the perfect part of it was the dog and the, and the dog looks the, the way the ears are pointing everything else. It's some version of between Batman and the Sphinx or whatever, however you want to describe it. And it's just, it's ideal, right? And to me, it's a perfect photo, right? Because it, it, 
captured the essence in that moment. And I think about how hard in photography it is to get those things. And I'm sure there's plenty of professional photographers that would tell you how challenging that is, right? That they can take thousands of photos and finding just the right one or finding the perfect moment can be difficult. Well, and weather's the same thing, right? But we all go through those things in life. If you've ever built a house of cards, I don't care what it is. You've probably worked on something where you recognize how hard it is to get to perfection. And there are other things in the moment when you see them that you go, wow, that's just right. But you don't necessarily appreciate the difficulty of getting there. And for all you people whose perfect weather is less, seemingly less complex than mine that is strikes this balance of warm air, cold air, amount of moisture and everything else, you may think, oh, it's no big deal. But it probably is, right? And, and let's just think about it from a planet perspective in general, okay? Can you imagine this Earth if every time water evaporated, it's just evaporated into space, right? That, that wouldn't be good. So we have this lucky thing up there called the tropopause, which is an area in our atmosphere where things stabilize. And the reason they stabilize is temperature stops falling with height and it starts warming up again. So we get this ba- this thermal boundary layer that keeps all that moisture. I'm not going to say all of it because in theory it can't escape, but it keeps what we know as all that moisture coming back down as rain and feeds you know the planet and the, all the things that we do. And the primary reason we have that boundary layer is this thing that you've probably heard of before called the ozone layer, right? And the ozone layer is kind of up there and it creates, it heats up. So basically what happens is the whole process of of ozone is ozone absorbs the vast majority of ultraviolet radiation. Okay. The vast majority of it. And I think it's in a particular part of the spectrum. I think it's UVB. I may be speaking out of, out of turn on that, but I think that's what it is. But without that, Life on the planet would be exceedingly difficult, much less anything else that goes. So the fact that we're walking around and enjoying so-called perfect weather, but that perfect weather can happen because there's this barricade, right, that stops things from going on. And very few things ever break above that. You will see scenarios, right, where we have this thing, we call it the tropopause, which is that boundary layer. And it, and don't get hung up on it. It's, it's, it's not like it's a fine line, although the ozone layer, when you think about it, it's amazingly thin. It's a few pennies thin, right? A few coins, whatever coin you want to pick. Just, it's like three millimeters. And what's even more fascinating about it sometimes is it's not like it's all ozone. It's just there's more ozone there than in other parts of the atmosphere. So it's a concentrated level. But because that thing heats up and creates this thermal barrier... Most of the time, weather doesn't escape into it. Most of the time, you will see what we call overshooting storms that puncture that level. And I've seen some being up in at flight at a certain level, right? And you've probably seen imagery of it. And I'll try to find one to include in the show notes. I'll, I'll put a link to something, just an example, so that if it, if you're not familiar with the term, you can see that. But another place that, that I've seen it or, or felt it before is it has to do with the what we call gravity waves. Or, or in, we see this in the mountains. We see wave activity that, you know, isn't visual because it's not like it's actually, you know, some no one threw a die into the wave and you can't necessarily follow it. But they, they flow a little differently. Yes, the, it's still dampened by this layer because of, of the dynamics of, of atmosphere and play. But at the same time, it can create ripples, if you will. And I've had such a situation. I still don't know what the explanation is. I was, I was doing a flight one time uh, from Chile back to North America. Okay. And on that flight, we were at, at flight altitude, which as you've probably, if you've ever done any long flights, you know that the, one of the goals is to get kind of pretty high. And quite often you're in the lower air areas of the stratosphere when you're up there. Because turbulence becomes less of an issue. And our plane was going along, going along, and wham. I mean, literally, just all of a sudden, we're banking to the left. plane came back moments after that. And I still don't know to this day if it was something to do with something like a volcano erupting. But 
I was reminded of it yesterday when I saw images and, and you could, I always love when, you know, the story kind of takes a life of its own. Right. And so somebody shared something on Twitter of how you could see in the atmosphere over the state of New York, there's a, this graphic of how atmospheric pressure changed as this event that took place around the globe propagated around the planet. So those waves from this event, that's another wave, volcano eruptions, not just, you know, but terrain, but volcano eruptions cause these rippling effects. And you can see it in the satellite imagery. You see the wave like motion. It's not just a plume. It's not just something simple, but you can actually see the rippling effect. And that would go over the entire planet. We, you think about it with tsunamis and stuff like that when you get in the waves, but those sort of things also happen in the atmosphere. All right. So you've got this stuff going on that has impacts. And was my plane hit by something like that? It could have been, it could have been. It could have been that it was a glitch in the plane, right? It could have been that the captain got up and bumped the, the something within the steering mechanism. I don't know. I, whatever it was, it didn't last. And so I didn't think about it. But it felt joltish. It didn't feel like somebody something that happened in the controls. It really felt like something in the atmosphere. But all these things, these little things, it's in moments like that that you recognize the power and the impact they can have. And volcanoes is an example of that. So volcanoes can, with their power, eject things into the stratosphere. And we've seen, you've heard it, we've seen it before, right? Where it kind of creates this big cloud. And that cloud can take years to dissipate because it kind of stays in that stratified, stratified layer, okay? And it can spread globally even over time. It takes a while to do that. But enough volcanoes erupt at once, and, and you've probably seen this in science fiction movies and wondered if it's true, but yes, it could. If we had a, a bunch of mass eruptions all at once, they could create a layer of clouds that could dampen the sun's ability to do everything that we need, warm us, create photosynthesis for plants to grow, make it difficult for life on Earth, and plummet us back into an ice age. So have we seen it? Do we believe that sort of thing has happened? We believe it could have. How do you prove it's a little more tricky, right? Um, we, we do have the technology, but we don't have, it's not like we saw it take place. So we, we can only deal with what we have of the evidence and try to string those, those ideas together into a viable theory. But that happens all the time. And it, and it, little things so whether it's making your weather perfect and, and and so think about it this way let's say you live on the west coast and i same thing i lived in chile right and so it has certain weather because it was up against the pacific and you get these kind of cold waters west coast like southern california here in the u.s same way no different than the gulf stream right which when you, people lose sight of this they forget how far north europe is compared to north america Yet the temperature values are roughly the same, and it's all because of this warm ocean water and the influence it has. So that's a big thing taking place, but little things within that, like if that current deviates a certain way, it can change weather for a lot of things. It can change that perfect weather and maybe taking an area that all of a sudden used to get six months of perfect weather, now it gets zero because there was a shift and that shift can be temporary or it can be long lasting. If there's something going on you know, on a climatary scale, right? That it lasts for a, an extended period of time. But weather also comes back and does it into other little things. And let's stay with the flight example, right? An airplane flies pretty much simply from, from a few very basic things. One is it's got to create power for speed. Speed's an element of it. But more or less what it's doing is it's creating enough speed that the shape of an airplane wing creates a difference in atmospheric pressure below and above that wing, which allows that plane to lift. But it's a weather element, atmospheric pressure, that changes, that allows that flight. And when the atmosphere says, no, I don't like that, whether it's a, a downburst or some other thing, or it, it changes something in the direction of, of the of the wind speed, the you know, the pilots have to adjust, the plane has to adjust to compensate for that. Now, with modern weather, it usually works out okay. But as an example, I had a friend who never wanted to do these flights I did from North to South America because he knew enough about this area called, it's called the Intertropical Convergence Zone, and it's something kind of near the equator. But it's one of these triggers during hurricane season that y you see because it's kind of this baseline of, of where these storm tracks come out of Africa for, for hurricanes that we get here in the Atlantic. 
But he knew enough about that. And there was an Air France flight that met disaster, right? Because of if you will, perfect storm conditions that between the human element, the computer element, and the weather element that led to a devastating situation. So weather impacts that perfection. So it's not just about, you know, it's like getting the perfect photo, right? If I got too many clouds and not enough clouds, it's going to impact the perfection there. But sometimes we lose sight of that. Sometimes we miss that ever so small, you know, if you've ever watched clouds kind of form in the atmosphere, here's an example. Do this. You can do this experiment at home. Take a humidifier out and watch the little clouds that form, right? And then they dissipate where you can't see it. Water vapor is still there. We've talked about water vapor recently, but you can't see the little cloud anymore, right? And so all these things go on all the time. All these little systems, whether they're earth systems or human systems or the combination thereof to create perfection. Whether that's creating your perfect weather and the weather you enjoy. So there's some dynamics at play, but there's probably somewhere out there a little thing that can get just a little out of whack that can have a big impact on your perfection or what you're used to either creating it or dissipating it. For your sake, I hope that your perfect weather is easy to come by. Mine's not so much, but like I said, I live with the anticipation. But just remember, just remember, when things seem perfect, it probably wasn't easy getting there, right? And that there's little things that can go a long way in altering that environment. And as always, there's much more to weather than the weather itself.